Hey everyone, Coach and Hoka One One Athlete Sage Candy here with another Training Talk Tuesday. I, don't, I think this is episode 10 maybe, I could be wrong, but today we're going to talk about detraining effects uh, in sprinters, middle distance runners, distance runners, some variables at play if you take, you know, five days off from running or uh, two weeks off from running, kind of the, the things that might happen to you in terms of, of losing performance or not. Uh, I'm just going to break that down, but excellent question. Thanks to everyone that submitted questions in the comments below and voted up. This was the top voted question, so it's what we're going to go with, and I'll put it up on the screen there. Uh, Sage, could you comment on detraining and performance? For example, what happens to the fitness of 100 slash 200 runners after five days, one week, or two weeks uh, off? I assume we're talking about 100 meters and 200 meters, not 100 mile and 200 mile races. What about mid-distance runners, long-distance runners? I realize there are variables that affect the answer, like training history and talent, but I would appreciate your insight on this. So, yeah, we'll break it down to those variables first, actually. And uh, kind of, you know, starting with the sprints, the 100-meter and 200-meter, which I will admit I am not uh, an expert on. Obviously, I'm a, a distance runner, and when you say mid-distance like me, I'm thinking still, you know, 800-meter, 1,500-meter. Ran a lot of those, but my wheelhouse was more 5K marathon and now ultra marathon and above. But I'll get into that. Uh, in a minute. So first variable uh, before we get into each event or distance length is uh, a lot of it comes down to genetics, honestly. Uh, not just your genetics in terms of how your body responds to the different stimulus or the different types of training you may do over your life, but you know what your chronological age is, what your training age is, like how, how, how long have you actually been running, uh, but also other background stuff like did you play soccer, did you swim a lot, Are you, do you have a big cycling background, or, you, know, you do other sports maybe as a child growing up or as a young adult, that all shapes and influences how your body responds to exercise and how it uh, maybe doesn't respond as differently to detraining or not doing exercise. As well as, you know, we talked about fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers in our last training talk. You know, some people have that sprint power, that explosive power, pretty much naturally. They say, and I'll probably get some flack for this, uh, sprinters are born, not made, right? And then that's implied that distance runners, are, you know, genetics is obviously very important. High VO2 max helps, but you could kind of will yourself uh, to better performances in long distance races, right? There's a certain training component, whereas if you put in the work, you do a lot of high mileage training, you get lucky and don't get hurt, uh, you know, you mentally commit yourself to pushing through as much pain as you can. There's a lot of mental thoughts going on in long distance races. You could actually do a lot better, whereas, you know, I could only mentally will myself so much at a 100 meter sprint. You know, I, I'm not going to run a 10 second 100 meters. You know, that ship has sailed for me. I, I don't want to put limits on you, but, you know, those guys in the Olympic trials and, and running under 10 seconds in the 100, most people can't do that. Most people can't do that no matter how hard they try mentally. You know, if I trained a lot doing a lot of explosive drills and, you know, power squats and stuff, you know, maybe I could have improved my 100 meter from 14 seconds to 13 seconds, but I'm not going to run under 11 seconds, right? I don't have the fast switch muscle fibers, the genetics, it's out of the cards. That's why I'm a distance runner, but I digress there. Um, so the idea with that, with the genetics is, okay, if you pull people off the street and they naturally are good athletes, they're good sprinters, yeah, it may be helped that they played soccer as a child or they played basketball or they lift weights and they go to the gym regularly. You know, those all influence you even if you're not training to be a really good 100 meter or 200 meter sprinter, you might just naturally have that ability to pull someone off the street. They race me at 100 meters. More often than not, a guy my age who's athletic is probably going to beat me because I'm slower than average at sprinting 100 meters. Uh, so, you know, that's a guy who's, who's in shape maybe from doing other sports. And, you know, the detraining effect in, in that regard is that you actually don't lose a ton of sprint speed if your baseline uh, is that you haven't focused as like a professional sprinter or maybe you didn't run track in college, you don't exercise that much. You know, if you stop exercising, it, you're only gonna lose marginal shape. Now, if you eat unhealthy and gain a lot of un unnecessary weight, yeah, that's gonna probably hurt your performance quite a bit. So there's other lifestyle factors at play there. But generally, the more focused an athlete is, the higher the level they reach in the sport, the more things get very marginal. The, that, you know, just a slight one or 2% difference to them is, a, is this vast chasm, right? Uh, so if you're just a little bit off, 
it makes a really big difference if you're a really fast at the top end of your sport, you're a really fast sprinter or you're a really fast distance runner. So, you know, it's all relative to what percentages we're talking about of your finishing time or your, your best baseline, so to speak. So detraining in, in sprinters, you know, a lot of the studies I looked at were actually done on soccer players. And uh, the threshold really seems to be that you definitely would lose your, your cutting edge sprint performance, even like a flying 30 meter sprint, really short, right? Um, and you, you start to definitely lose some endurance, but these are well-conditioned athletes, right? Soccer is a, a great conditioning sport. You got to sprint, you got to have endurance. Um, and they're losing their edge after two weeks for sure. So the two week threshold is, is a big difference versus one week or five days, you know, five days off could be a really nice little taper. You don't totally lose your edge after five days, even as an elite. Uh, and if you're, if you're less elite, um, you know, five days off might not be a big deal at all. A lot of times people get injured, they have to take some time off and it's a great taper. They get fresh, they, they rest more and they're able, they have more spring in their step. So the threshold really seems to be one week off, five days off, pretty marginal. It could improve your performance. Uh, two weeks off, you start kind of losing your edge. It's probably going to start hurting your performance a bit. And so that's kind of the difference uh, in the detraining effect. And, you know, from sprints moving up to mid-distance, I'd say in distance, mid-distance and distance running, and we're talking, you know, 800 meter on up, uh, ultra running is going to be a little bit different maybe. Uh, but let's say 800 meters to the marathon for mid-distance and distance runners, you're definitely going to lose your edge, uh, especially as an elite. Um, I think the number one thing, besides like just losing, going through the motions, that neuromuscular stimulus of being fast and, and you know getting on the track and ripping 200s every day, uh, you know that doesn't go away. Your base doesn't totally erode, right? But you'll start losing that edge of what pace you might be able to push right at what we call the lactate threshold or anaerobic threshold, actually, anaerobic capacity in the 800, being able to buffer lactic acid and be able to move lactate around. You know, you could do a really hard workout, rest for five days, you'll be golden. You tapered, you still have that buffering capacity, you're right at VO2 max or above velocity at VO2 max. But if you start taking over a week off, seven to 10 days off, you're gonna come out flat maybe. And we call that, you know, if you taper too much, elite athletes who run mid distances, uh, 800 meters, 1500 meters, 3K, maybe even 5K, you know, if you taper too much, you don't totally take a whole week off unless you get injured and, or sick, which sometimes athletes recover from very well and race their personal best. Uh, but, you know, that could be also more of a mental thing. You feel fresh, uh, or if you were overtrained and you rest, that could also help your performance. But say you're optimally trained and you taper too much, you take, you know, 10 days totally off. Well, you might start gaining a little weight if you don't watch your diet, right? Because you're used to burning all these calories and then you're sitting on the couch eating ice cream. Uh, you know, if you're eating ice cream and exercising, you'd probably, you know, be at a different weight. So you kind of lose your edge. And even if it's very marginal, even if it's just, you know, two or three percent for a, a high level 800 meter runner, you know, that's that's pretty significant, right? That's losing that sprint in the last 150 meters or something, you know? Uh, so it, it's very fine line and i'd say for mid-distance runners it's more of a big deal than it is for the sprinters you know for the soccer players 100 200 meters okay it's marginal mid-distance running and, and you know distance running 3k 5k when you're at vo2 max maximum capacity maximum heart rate for minutes on end uh if you're just a little off you're going to start losing it and that comes down with distance running with the aerobic fitness right they've done studies where you know even elite distance runners especially elite distance runners uh you know you start losing five, six percent of your VO2 max after taking two weeks off. That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Uh, if you're less, if you're not an elite athlete and you run more modest mileage, you know, you run 30 miles a week, 50K a week, you're in shape, maybe that taper is okay for you. Uh, it might, you might not notice as big of a difference. Whereas if uh, you're someone like me in the past who ran 100 miles a week training for a 5K, 160 kilometers a week, uh, if I start tapering and, and, you know, only run a third of that mileage, it's a detraining effect and it's usually not good. Uh, I've actually run better races where I didn't even taper very much at all. And uh, when I ran my marathon PR at, at Hanson's Brooks in, in 2011, 10 years ago, uh, you know, we barely tapered off of 100 miles a week. It'd be like this last 10 day taper where the mileage went down a little bit, but you're still doing a lot of intensity. You still got that muscle memory. You still are coughing off, out the cobwebs of the lungs going close to 90%, 95% VO2 max. 
Granted, you taper, it's shorter stimulus, but there's still an intense stimulus. So if you think of it like lifting weights, and I don't know a ton about lifting weights, but you know, if you're bench pressing a lot regularly, two or three times a week, you get used to that certain weight, a certain number of reps. Well, if you take time off, you're not gonna lose all that. You still got your pec strength, you still got your arm muscle power, right? But you might not be at your best, right? You might, you know, all of a sudden it might feel like, oh, you know, I can't do the last, that last rep. I'm not powering through. Whereas if you re rest just a little bit, you're just enough, you get fresh, you might set a personal best. So it's really a fine line of the timing of it, the genetics of it, and what relative amounts of training and high performance or the performance ceiling you've been reaching in these different events. Now, like I said, we get up to 5K, 10K, marathon even, still don't want to taper too much. And, uh, you know, if you taper too much, it throws off your metabolism maybe in the marathon, right? You still taper, you still have some marathon pace intensity or even faster than marathon pace intensity in that last two weeks, right? You don't just stop training and say, oh, I'm going to rest 100% of the time for the marathon. No, you keep going up with your mileage. You keep some strides in there. You keep some intense tempo efforts in there. Ideally, that's uh, the way we structure things. Because if you don't, after 10 days, I'd say you're going to start losing some endurance. Uh, you're going to lose that cutting edge. Maybe part of it's mental as well. Uh, you just mentally kind of check out because you're like, I'm on vacation. I'm resting up. Uh, you know, I don't have to push myself. I, don't, I forgot what the pain feels like. It could throw off your whole pacing strategy as well because if you're not dialed into that pace every couple days, uh, you might start losing that ability to monitor your body's signals as well. Now, when we get into ultra running, uh, talking about over 50K, 50K and above, I actually think it's a little bit more like sprinting. Uh, as my Hoka One One teammate Carl Meltzer, the most winningest 100 miler uh, in the history of ultra running, he's won the most 100 mile races, he calls it ro rolling off, he, he did off the couch training. He rolled off the couch, rolled out, won 100 miles, right? He doesn't run super high mileage. He doesn't even run super regularly. He runs pretty regularly. I'm having trouble saying that word, sorry. Um, but, you know, compared to like someone running 120 miles a week, 200K a week, he might run less than half that volume, but he's got this residual base. And if you have a long-term, he's also in his, he might be 50 now. Uh, he's, he's older than me. We'll put it that way. But, uh, and he's been doing it for a long time, winning for a long time, but he has that whole lifetime base of miles. He has that lifetime base of experience. He started running track in high school. He was actually a pretty good miler, um, but I digress there. But if you have that base, you could kind of almost fake it more in some ultras, some ultras, I should say. Uh, it's hard to fake it through like 100 miles, but you know, 50K, 100, 100K, you know, if you're pretty fit and you have that base mileage, you don't need a whole lot of intensity, right? It's not like a lactate threshold thing or a VO2 max thing. You just need to be able to survive. And it comes down to a lot of it comes down to race nutrition, hydration, being smart with your pacing, going back on all your experience and just being consistent if you're consistent long term, you have this long aerobic base history, even if it's not super high mileage, and you've got some talent to play. Carl's got some talent, right? Uh, you could actually do pretty well in ultras. And if you had to take a week or two off because you got a little bit of an injury, it's not as big of a deal, I'd say. Uh, now, as you get into you know really elite level performances, dialing in for Comrades Ultra Marathon or World 100K you know championship or you know UTMB Western States, yeah, those top guys are training a lot. Uh, and top women, and it's a very fine line, a very fine edge. Uh, but, you know, residual based fitness in ultras, long distance ultras, a lot of it's pretty low intensity, lower heart rate spikes compared to the mid distance running track events where you're right at 100% max heart rate uh, and you're pushing your, your anaerobic thresholds and, you know, VO2 max in the 5K uh, type of event. Um, so, it is a little bit of a different spectrum, and that's the way I see it with the detraining effect. Again, though, it's always better if you have a little bit of an injury to take some extra days off because if that injury goes too bad or you overtrain, you're going to be a lot worse off, right? The old saying goes, you know, it's better to be 10% uh, undertrained than 1% overtrained, right? Because if you're 1% overtrained, you might only race at 80%. Whereas if you're 10% undertrained, you're still racing at 90%, 95% maybe. Uh, you're not going to totally screw yourself over. You're going to stay healthy. You're going to be consistent. Yeah, it's better to be towing the starting line healthy and take those rest days if you need them. Take an extra taper if you need it. Recover from illness if you get really sick or you have a big health problem. 
you do have to come back gradually and slowly, and I'm, I'm learning that personally right now. Uh, so it is about being patient still, and it's, it is a fine balance, and it, it does depend at the end of the day on the individual and other lifestyle factors. So uh, complicated answers and variables that, you know, I can't answer that question really directly, but there were a lot of variables there, and uh, hope that helps. Hope that gives you some context. Comment below for next week's Training Talk topic. Training Talk Tuesdays, I do them every week. Uh, the top voted question will get uh, my answer on there. Uh, thanks for subscribing on here. Really appreciate the support, the Patreon supporters that really make this channel possible. Thank you so much. Thanks to title sponsor, Hoka One One. Keeping the dream alive. Got some more training talks and vlog updates, as well as other stuff coming your way. Subscribe on this channel, like these videos. Thanks again, and stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions.